Okay, I'm going to be reading The Man with the Periwinkle Eyes. Fire and Rain, 2024. This is the first book in a series written by John Whitberg. Oops, hang on. Sorry, I have to find it. <laughs> so I'm reading from the downloaded first, this is like, probably like the first um, edition, downloaded. Okay, dedication to the 300,000 lost boys of the U.S. Air Force's time travel program at Camp Hero, Fort Warden, the Presidio, and New Orleans. You are not forgotten. Rest in peace. And to all those who made this book possible, Jack Flynn, Catherine Bennett, Bo Mangano, Daniel Sala, Christy Campbell, and all the many others whom I cannot name, thank you. Forward. Hello all. No doubt there's an interesting story as to how you wound up here, and I hope you'll find this book interesting enough to be worth staying for. A bit of history first, I think, is necessary. Likely this will mostly be review for many of you, but here it goes. In 1945, following their defeat in World War II, Germany and Japan made secret deals with certain ET groups, notably the Draco Empire, who agreed to help the former Axis powers build an empire among the stars in exchange for mercenary services. The nations agreed and thus began a process of war, conquest, and colonization which is ongoing. In 1946, Admiral Richard Byrd initiated Operation High Jump, a U.S. naval expedition to Antarctica. Ostensibly, this was to test military equipment in extreme icy conditions. In secret, it was chasing the Axis powers to their new forward operating base in Queen Maud's land, Antarctica, known to these Axis powers as New Schwabenland. The U.S. Navy engaged these Axis powers militarily. With their new ET-granted equipment, the Axis defeated the naval aggressors, thereby ending World War II with a decisive Axis victory and beginning a secret Cold War between the Allies on Terra and the Axis Draco Alliance off world. In summer 1947, a German craft was shot down over Roswell, New Mexico and stripped by the U.S. Air Force for reverse engineering. Its navigation chair proved to be of particular interest as it was discovered through documents on board the ship to be capable of navigation through space and time and even into other dimensions. The research into this chair was moved to a newly constructed deep underground military base or DUMB, D -U -M -B, underneath Camp Hero, also known as Montauk Air Force Station at Montauk Point, Long Island, New York. Thus began what came to be popularly known as the Montauk Project, though its real name was and still is Project Phoenix. The author asked the reader to, quote, put a pin in that, unquote. In 1952, the secret Cold War escalated. A delegation of German ships flew by the White House in Washington, D.C., one of these ships landed on the lawn of the White House, and the occupants personally approached then-President Harry S. Truman and began negotiations 
which continued into the next presidency under Dwight D. Eisenhower, inaugurated in January 1953. A deal was made. 150,000 American children would be given to the Germans off-world annually in exchange for American autonomy being ostensibly respected. This deal is still enforced as of writing this. Due to this, the American government escalated the Cold War with the Axis powers in space. In 1953, the American intelligence community, spearheaded by the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, began Project MKUltra, which used techniques learned from the Illuminati to carry out mind fracture, or the process of splitting the mind into alters, or split personalities. These personalities could then be programmed by the intelligence community for use in secret programs, both on and off planet. The U.S. also began making deals with various ET groups, gaining technology hundreds of years ahead of what the Terran public is allowed access to. The author of this book, myself, John Whitberg, is a survivor of these programs. Like all other survivors, my mind was split into altars, and these altars placed into clone bodies via consciousness extraction. One of these altars was a man by the name of Kyle Dalshaw. I hope I said that right. Sent to work initially in a program known as Project IBIS, and then in 1984, to the aforementioned Project Phoenix. He was noted for his periwinkle blue eyes. This book is his story. Some housekeeping. Every word of this book is true. While some names have no doubt been changed to protect the innocent and some truly horrendous events removed to keep this book from becoming misery porn, every event in this book happened and in the exact way it is recounted. Also of note is that certain popular songs are talked about in a way that is alternative to how they are supposed to have been written. The author is making no claim of copyright and is therefore not liable for any legal proceeding. For the style of this book, I have chosen a decidedly novelistic style with a journalistic bent as this seemed the simplest fashion in which to write it, it being in part a detailed biography and also a historical account. This book is not intended for children or the faint of heart and should not be read by either such demographic, as it contains profanity, violence, sexuality, Nazism, and upsetting revelations about the nature of our reality in keeping with the real story it is telling. Survivors of MK Ultra, Project Monarch, Project Phoenix, Project Looking Glass, and any and all other time travel programs, secret space programs, and super soldier programs are advised to take some caution reading this book as it is liable to be highly triggering. I'm afraid I must also make a rather large request of the reader, and that is that they dispense all notions of linear time, as this quite simply is not applicable to the life of the man whose story is being told. With all that out of the way, please enjoy the ride. There is nothing more beautiful or more mysterious than the stars in the sky. And look now at us. We are dancing among them. Der Bund Proverb. Okay, chapter one. Kyle Delchow. Is that it? Delchow or Delchow? Sorry. Kyle Delchow walks slowly among the icy rocks, careful not to slip. With the weak gravitational pull, a slip on this moon could mean tumbling off its surface entirely. 
Reaching a relatively dry and stable spot, he checked the wrist-mounted computer on his spacesuit, gesturing to Lisa Hoffner, his partner for this mission, to stop as well and be seated on one of the rocks, though not to set down the mysterious black metal case that they were carrying. Its contents, whatever they were, could not risk being lost. The computer revealed that the pair still had half a kilometer to travel to the coordinates given them. They paused for perhaps five minutes, then resolutely set out once again. They saw not a soul on their trek, though when trying not to fall off the face of the moon they walked on, it wouldn't have been difficult to miss a few. <laughs> they reached the coordinates set for them in good time. At fixed coordinates, they found an indentation in the ground that had obviously been carved by man. Otherwise, nothing marked this spot as special. Karl and Hoffner glanced at each other. Then, with a shrug, Kyle placed the metal case in the indentation. It fit perfectly. Kyle knew they would never receive an explanation for this venture. M16, particularly the off-planet ops sector, wasn't in the habit of explaining itself to its employees. No sooner had Kyle placed the box in its designated location than Hoffner let out the cry of hostiles ahead. <clears throat> Almost instantly projectiles began to fly. Kyle ducked behind a rock as he drew his plasma pistol so as to gain a chance to look at their uninvited guests. Hoffner did the same. The hostiles, Kyle could see, wore black spacesuits unlike the burnt orange ones he and Hoffner wore. He could also see that their suits were more advanced, being more streamlined and tight, allowing freedom of movement, and they appeared to have some sort of anti-gravity levitation system in the boots, which allowed them to perform massive jumps and maneuvers, perfect for this nearly zero-gravity environment. The battle was hopeless. The black-clad assailants numbered at least ten, all armed with rifles, against Kyle and Hoffner in their much less advanced suits, with only pistols. They didn't stand a chance, but they'd be damned if they didn't try. For humanity, Hoffner screamed, rising up and blasting her pistol. Kyle did the same. They actually succeeded in taking out two of the hostiles, one of them, in response, pulled another weapon, this one also a rifle, but stubby and with a fat barrel. He aimed it up, a grenade launcher, Kyle realized too late. The terrain actually protected him from the blast itself. Hoffner, however, was not so lucky. Kyle caught a glimpse of her remains being sprayed into space. As the impact of the explosion, combined with the debris, sent him flying from where he stood. Somehow he was not sent flying into space, but rather along the icy surface of the moon. He went quite a distance, but unexpectedly regained his footing on a dry spot after colliding with a rocky outcropping. For a split second he thought himself safe until he saw it. There was a pebble or tiny piece of shrapnel lodged in the glass of his suit. It had made a crack, and the crack was spreading. Fuck, Kyle swore. Was it really going to end this way? He pawed desperately and fruitlessly at his helmet, helpless to stop the spreading of the crack which was leading the glass to its inevitable shattering. I suppose this biography should, in earnest, begin, as so many do, with a birth. Kyle Del Chao was a clone created in a laboratory in the underground facility known as Cheyenne Mountain Complex in 2007. This clone was genetically altered and infused with the DNAs of Draco and Aldebaran Nordic ETs then as a small embryo sent back in time and placed in a chosen woman's womb as a surrogate. 
Kyle was born on January 8, 1941, at 2.14 a.m. in Koenigschut, I hope I spelled that, said that right, Upper Silesia, Germany, now Czortosau, Poland. His mother had an affinity for Celtic culture, hence him having the decidedly non-Teutonic name of Kyle. His parents were Helmut Delchow and Irena Delchow, nee Kaufmann. Both were avowed members of the National Socialist Deutsche Arbeiter Part, oh, <laughs> better known as the Nazi Party. Due to an asthma condition, Helmut was never sent to the front. The trouble began on a fateful day in December of 1944. Helmut returned from his work early that day in a clear state of shock. Irina, he said, we must bleed. Why, dear, and why are you looking in such shock? Do you have such little faith in our Fuhrer? Why, this is our sovereign German territory. Yes, Helmut replied, it is, but I heard a report today. The Russians are killing and expelling Germans, and our government has lied to us. The war has lost. Neither of them knew that young Kyle had overheard this exchange. Helmut's words proved true. Within days, German expellees from the east began arriving in Koenigschut, some in vehicles, some on horseback, but most of all on foot. They brought with them stories of massacres and mass rapes and reprisals. This prompted many Koningshut residents to begin making preparations for flight into the Reich interior. Due to being owners of a store, the Delchows had to spend several days liquidating their assets. It was clear by late December 1944 that it was unlikely they would be coming back. A plan was hatched to send young Carl away ahead of them. One of the local schools had arranged an evacuation by train of a group of German children to be taken by train to Berlin. Irina Delchow had a sister in the city, Miss Johanna Kaufman. Arrangements were made for her to pick Carl up at the station and care for him until the Delchows arrived. Whether any of these parties knew what was to happen, it's unlikely we shall ever know. The train from Koenigschut to Ber Berlin on December 21, 1944, was one of the very few remaining passenger trains still running, was at capacity with refugees. In fact, it was beyond it, as a number of persons had bribed the conductor to allow them to be seated in the bathrooms, gallery, and, ba and luggage car. A group of soldiers were assigned to oversee the boarding to ensure that women and children passengers were given priority. The sounds of the Russian front approaching could already be heard from the outskirts of town. However, even then, there was still propaganda being disseminated of a Nazi redoubt in the S Sudetenland. Those who believed it still did not flee. Kyle was approaching the train. One of his hands was held by the woman of the couple overseeing the group of children. His other hand was held by his mother, who was holding on to his father. It was not until the doors of the carriage opened and the cry of, All aboard! went out, that Kyle realized he had lost hold of his mother's hand. He turned to look as he was ushered onto the train to see that his grandparents have both been lost in the sea of people on the platform his parents not grandparents never did he ever see them again as the train rolled on the war increasingly became a topic of conversation among the train's passengers talk of reprisals against the Russians was oft discussed and other such fantasies also discussed was the housing crisis inside Germany, which had already begun due to bombings. Many refugees seemed to have no idea where they were intending to go as their lives were all outside of Germany proper. 
The train departed Koenigshoot at 1046 a.m. At about noon, it stopped in a small village to refuel as it had already come quite a distance. When the noise of the engine stopped, one could easily and plainly hear numerous German, American, British, and Russian planes flying overhead. There was considerable apprehension as to if these planes would pick an easy target and bomb a sitting train. Eventually, as the passengers waited, a conductor came into the car. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, we are asking all passengers to disembark for some hours. We have received word that they are having to lay new rails up ahead as the old ones were bombed. Please disembark and have some refreshments in the station. That's it, demanded one woman. We'll be next. A number of passengers simply abandoned their luggage, deciding to continue on foot. The couple leading the evacuation of the children from Koningschutte discussed the possibility, but it was decided that they would wait for the train. The group had been waiting in the station for a number of hours when two SS personnel entered the station. One very tall man with jet black hair and piercing blue eyes and a smaller strawberry blonde woman, both in SS uniforms with quite a number of medals visible. The two SS personnel approached the group of children. The older children and the couple leading them all stood and saluted them. The SS man produced a clipboard. <clears throat> I'm here to collect, he squinted at the name, Kyle Delshaw. Kyle noticed that he pronounced it as Kyla. The woman of a couple leading the children approached the SS personnel. <clears throat> I and my husband represent him. What is your business here, she asked. He is a child in this group, and I'm afraid you must produce him. We are here to collect him. Business of the state, replied the SS woman. By that point, young Kyle had stood and moved closer to the SS man, as he had known his parents would expect him to do. Despite his intimidating appearance, he had a kind demeanor and smiled at the young boy as he approached. In spite of the obvious apprehension of the couple in charge of the children, Kyle was soon escorted out and loaded into the back of a large black car. The SS woman drove while the man sat at the back to entertain Kyle. It was by then close to nightfall. The trio drove for hours through Germany. The signs of war were obvious. The SS man attempted to keep Kyle distracted from these sights. Whether this was to spare Kyle's feelings or simply to save face by hiding the obviously desperate situation, we shall never know. A note of potential importance. The SS man had the surname of Kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R, -E while the SS woman had the surname Messerschmitt, M-E-S-S-E-R-S-C-H-M-I-D-T. That's me spelling it. I include this info on the off chance that some readers will be inclined to check some archives for any potential information on them. Eventually, exhausted by the day, Kyle fell asleep. He was awoken by a large light shining into his face. The car had reached a checkpoint just outside the city of Dresden. This was in late December of 1944, less than two months before the infamous bombing of Dresden which occurred on February 13, 1945. As a result, the beauty of the city was still very evident. It was by now the dead of night. It seemed that electricity was being rationed as not even the street lights were on. The only lights came from the few cars on the streets and the occasional gas light in the windows of a few homes and apartments. The car eventually pulled into a small, blind alley off a side street. It rounded several corners in this alley to a portion where it was quite invisible to the outside world, except possibly from the roofs of the then empty industrial buildings that made up this district. The trio then disembarked from the vehicle. The SS woman Messerschmitt glanced at her watch 
We are early, Jürgen, she said to Kramer. German punctuality, my dear, German punctuality, was Kramer's reply. Young Kyle tapped the SS man on the back and then motioned to him that he had a need to make water. The man and boy stepped around a corner out of sight of Miss Messerschmidt to do this. It was as they returned that they were greeted by a flash of brilliant blue light against one of the walls of the alley. The light formed into an oval shape, perhaps seven feet, 2.3 meters in height. The oval very suddenly became hollow and showed it wasn't a light at all, but a portal that had opened. Messer Schmidt glanced at her watch once again. They are early too, she said. German punctuality, my dear, German punctuality, Kramer once again replied. It was becoming a running joke. Young Carl was not at all frightened. Rather, he was curious. The portal had a blue mist over its body, through which one could just make out the picture that lay beyond, of what appeared to be a warehouse, with a, ma with a manned desk also visible just beyond a downward slope. Well, we've come all the way from 28 years from now. Let's not disappoint, Messerschmidt remarked. Come on now, young Kyle, commanded Kramer, taking the boy's hand. With curiosity, and perhaps by now a touch of trepidation, Kyle took the man's hand, as he knew his parents would want him to do, and the trio walked to and through the portal. He perhaps knew even at that young age that with extreme naivete, that his life would be forever altered. What he didn't know but soon would was what would greet him on the other side of the portal, Project Ibis and all that it implied. Author's note. The reader may, upon reading this, be inclined to detect a certain sympathy by the author on behalf of the Nazi regime and its territorial claims. This is the opposite of the case. I am telling these historic events as seen through the eyes of one German boy who was not quite yet four years old. Nothing more and nothing less. End of chapter one.